Hi there, I'm Rob. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to continue exploring Microsoft Excel 2016 with part two of our Excel Like a Pro training. Last month, we introduced you to the basics. This time around, we're going deeper and we're going to have our intermediate class. And next month, we'll complete the series with our advanced webinar. Although it should go without saying, I'm gonna say it anyway, if you missed the basics webinar, you should catch up by viewing Excel Like a Pro Training Part 1. You can look for it on YouTube. Today's class builds on top of the basics with minimal refreshers, so make sure you've got the basics down. Okay, let's get started. Here's our roadmap for today. Last time out, Melanie touched on multiple worksheets. Uh, so first off today, I'll show you how to create links between worksheets and then between workbooks. Then we'll move on to managing lists, followed by working with dates and some of the functions and formulas associated with dates. Then on to formatting and conditional formulas. And then finally, we'll finish up with if, and, and, or functions, uh, some of the logical functions that Excel offers. So, working with multiple worksheets and workbooks. First, navigating. Remember that every Excel file is a workbook and each page in it is a worksheet. These worksheets are denoted as tabs here at the bottom. Just click the one you want to activate or use control page up or control page down to move among them using the keyboard. Now to move or copy one of these tabs, just right click on it and choose move or copy and you'll be presented with this dialog box. If you want to move it to a work, a completely different workbook, you can enter the name of the workbook here. If you simply want to move it around the current workbook, this is how you do it. Obviously a longer list, you would have scroll bars here on the right. And then to create a copy of a worksheet, just activate that checkbox. Okay, so now let's talk about working with formulas across worksheets. We have this worksheet here with several different types of information and different labels. Okay, apples, oranges, bananas, lemons, very different. Let's calculate the data across more than one sheet. You can do that by creating what Excel calls 3D formulas. Think of a 3D formula as a cross-reference or an endnote in a book. You literally go to this page and retrieve this specific information and bring it back. So, how do we create a formula that pulls in information from another worksheet? Let's walk through it. Here we have three worksheets for our grocery store inventory costs. In addition to seeing our fruit costs broken down, we'd like to see at a glance what the bakery and meat department costs are, okay? Let's get rid of this accident, uh, this worksheet we accidentally created. And we have uh, fruit and we're going to have the bakery pull into right here. So the way you do that is you hit the equal sign to start a formula and we're going to bring in a sum. And then you click the left parentheses, navigate to the bakery tab, click on the cell we want, in this case B7. And all you need to do at this point is hit enter. We go back to the fruit worksheet and you can see bakery has been filled in. Now let's do it again, but this time we don't want the full range uh, with, of the meats. We just want a couple of the meats. So again, equal sum left paren, click the meats tab. And this time we want chicken and we're gonna hold down the control key and choose fish. Both are selected, we hit enter, and now we just have those two categories brought into the meats tab, very easy. Let's look at the syntax for a moment up here in the function bar. You can see here that the name of the sheet is literally brought in and then an exclamation point is added to the end of it. And then of course the cell reference later when we look at workbooks, you'll see that there's a specific syntax for them as well. Okay, so that's a look at using 3D formulas to link together worksheets. And it's a great method to build summary or master worksheets that bring data together in one place. It's also the method you'll have to use if the labels and data types are 
different from worksheet to worksheet, like in our case where we have different fruit categories and we have different breads and bakery items and different meats, okay? So you definitely want to be using 3D formulas for worksheets such as these. But let's look at another method for linking worksheets. And in this case, we've been very organized in setting up our data, meaning our labels and data ranges don't change from worksheet to worksheet. And we want to bring the data together without typing in 3D formulas. In that case, we can use an Excel tool called Consolidate Data. Let's say that you have a sales team and a weekly report of each rep's sales. You have a sheet for each week, week one, week two, week three, and week four, and you'd like to total that data into a monthly report. There are two ways to consolidate this data, by position or by category. Let's spend a few moments on the definitions of both of these. First, consolidation by position. When the data in the source areas is arranged in the same order and uses the same labels, use this method to consolidate data from a series of worksheets, such as departmental budget worksheets that have been created from the same template. So that's consolidate by position. Consolidation by category is when the data in the source areas is not in the same order, but uses the same labels use this method to consolidate data from a series of worksheets that have different layouts but have the same data labels. For our purposes here, I'm only going to demonstrate consolidation by position because in general, it is an organizational best practice. Once you're aware of the power of this tool, you'll want to set your sheets up to take advantage of it and by having consistency across worksheets, it'll be easier for you and anyone else to quickly get their bearings within the notebook. So let's look at an example workbook that shows the sales achieved by each sales rep by each day of the week. And each week is on its own worksheet. As we can see, we have data that is in the same order and uses the same labels. In other words, the same consistent layout. It's gonna make consolidating data work like a charm. Let's go to our master sheet. We wanna click in the upper left hand corner and we wanna use an area where the consolidated data has room to appear. So it's best to create a clean worksheet for this. If you're gonna consolidate data on a worksheet with pre-existing data, make sure that you leave enough cells to the right and below the cell for the consolidated data to appear, okay? So let's go to the data tab, click consolidate. Here's our dialog box. By default, sum is our function. There are many other functions that you can use with consolidate data. I'd say average is probably the next most common to sum. All right, now we wanna choose our ranges from each of the worksheets. So we're gonna collapse this dialog box with the up arrow. We're gonna click on week one. We're gonna select the entire range and the labels. We're going to bring the dialog box back and we're gonna add that week to the references, all right? Now, it's not hard to do the rest of them because our data and labels are consistent. If we click on week two, it's already pre-selected click add. Same for week three, click on the worksheet, click add, click on the worksheet for week four, click add. That's it. We have now told Excel all of the data that we want to be consolidated onto the very first master worksheet. We want to make sure we have the labels. So top row and left column labels, we want those. And now let's spend a couple minutes talking about creating links. We need to choose from automatic or manual updates. Clicking here is what makes it automatic. If you want Excel to update your consolidation table automatically and when any source data changes, we're gonna check this box. If you leave it unchecked, you're gonna have to update the consolidation manually by returning to the tool. So obviously we wanna be so organized that automatic updates are given. 
In a couple of minutes, I'll show this in action. We'll change Sally's sales on one of the days of one of the weeks, and you'll see that it updates automatically. So again, the automatic updates and this option right here is really the power, really shows the power of a well-designed and linked workbook. It makes it readable and efficient. Now, a few more important notes before we see the results. You can't create links when the source and the destination areas are on the same worksheet. This explains why it makes sense to group data into worksheets by smaller periods. In this case, we did it by weeks. We knew that we could easily review a week at a glance. Perhaps with such a small sales team, we could have organized our worksheet by month and have had all the data for all the weeks on one worksheet. That might have worked fine, but what happens if the team grows? Perhaps the sheet would eventually become too long to review without scrolling. It's some food for thought. Remember, before you build a worksheet, you want to ask yourself, how do you want to see and analyze the results? How much detail is needed to draw a conclusion? And what is the most important data for decision makers, whether that's you or your manager? All right, so back to our work at hand. Press OK and Excel will generate the consolidation for you. It will be unformatted, so it's up to you to format it, but you only need to do that once unless you didn't choose automatic, you didn't choose create links, and you have to run manual consolidations repeatedly. So again, another reason you want to organize your data and be consistent across worksheets. So notice the row numbers here. They're non-sequential. What does that mean? Well, let's unhide them. Right click, choose unhide. Look at that. When you consolidated, it did show you an eagle's eye view from above of just the summary of everything, but it truly brought in all the data as well. So let's go ahead and hide that back again. Actually, you know what, we, we will leave it. We'll just undo. All right, so I mentioned I wanted to show you what happens if we update somebody. So as you can see on the master here, Sally's total for all the Thursdays is $1,000. Let's go into week, I think week four, and let's say we, she actually, we missed by a decimal here. She actually had a banner $3,500 day. We do that, we go back to the master, and you can see it's been updated right here. One last bit about consolidation that leads us into talking about linking across workbooks. If the worksheet that contains the data that you want to consolidate is in another workbook, uh, let's go into the consolidation dialog. You first want to browse for that workbook, okay? And then you'll select the references in the same way that you did before. Excel will create the path for you and you'll see that the workbook name is in there as we saw earlier with the worksheets and it has an exclamation point, okay? That's it for consolidating workbooks. We'll now turn to linking workbooks. So up to this point, we've been working in one workbook with several worksheets, right? In the same way that we can pull data in from many worksheets, we can do the same with workbooks. So let's take a look. You'll remember earlier I referred to a 3D formula as a cross-reference, a connection between one or more worksheets. Well, when that linking crosses into a different workbook, it's called an external reference. So when would you use this? Sticking with our sales team example, you could have a workbook for each month or even each year. It depends on, of course, the time period you'd like to consolidate. So here's how it works. Uh, we're back with our sales team and it's now ending the end of a second month. Uh, in our monthly sales to workbook, we want to see how the team is doing against the previous month. So here on the master worksheet, we are going to add a link to last month's total. So our formula will start as they all do with an equal sign and we don't need any function because we're just creating a link. So we are going to jump over to last month's worksheet, monthly sales, and all we need to do is click on the cell that we want to summon, 
and hit enter. And here's our total for last month, okay? Let's pause again on the syntax of the formula. So you'll notice the file name of the other workbook, monthly sales, is in brackets, even has the extension. Here's the sheet that it refers to and the cell reference. And in order for this particular external reference to work, the single quote marks have been added. And that is because there is a non-alphanumeric character in the file name, and that's this space right here. Keep in mind, particularly if you move folders or put things on a server, that the links can be broken. So you'll wanna have a workflow that reduces the breaking of links by having files, you don't want files moving around, all right? And if they do, you know that you need to add these single quote marks to help you out in diagnosing file names that may not be alphanumeric and for tracking down file names or file locations when links are broken, okay? Let's uh, quickly, before we finish this section, let me show you the way to create the link in the opposite way. So we're gonna put it right here, but we're gonna start in our first file. All you need to do is copy or control C, go back, and you're not gonna do a paste, you're gonna do a paste special right here. And down at the bottom left, paste link. And there it is. If you look, they're exactly the same. So you have options, you have flexibility in the way that you build your links. But again, just remember, you have to maintain them. That's very important and refer to the syntax to help you do that. And now on to our next topic. Our next topic is managing lists. Many people use Excel to create lists of contacts or they use it for mailing lists or for inventory purposes. Think of a list as a database, a collection of information. It differs from a table because it doesn't typically use formulas. Rather, it's manipulated into different views through sorting and filtering, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. So here, what you see is an example list. It's a list of all the National League Cy Young Award winners since 1967. And because lists are meant to be sorted or filtered, we can look at the data in different ways so it's really important that lists have column headings, as you can see up here in row one. It, it's very important that there are no empty rows anywhere in the list as we go down, as you can see. So let's talk about simple sorting. Uh, right now, this list is organized by year from 67 up until 2017. Let's say instead that we want to see it ordered by who had the most wins among everyone in this list. What we do is we click the column header for wins, and then we go over here and choose sort and filter, and we are going to sort from highest to lowest. More wins is better. Again, this is called a simple sort, and you can see here that uh, it runs from 27 all the way down to two and it's no longer organized by year, and obviously it rearranged all the data and kept each row uh, as its own self. So let's do something a little bit more complex and sort by multiple columns. You see this cluster of uh, pictures with 24 wins? They're really sorted by random. In fact, they're still in order by year, and that doesn't really tell us anything. So again, let's click Sort and Filter, and this time we're gonna choose custom sort. And you can see here's our first sort and we're going to add a level. And the column we want is earned run average, ERA. And uh, it already picked smallest to largest, so maybe Excel knows something. Um, but uh, for those of you who don't know, the smaller the ERA, the better. So that's our sort and we click it and you can quickly see that this cluster of 24 is now ordered down by ERA. Okay, pretty easy, right? 
So next we're going to look at auto filtering. This is a way to include and exclude any row data. Again, we're going to select any column label or header and then back under sort and filter, we're going to choose filter. All right, and you can see to the right of every column header, there is now a drop down menu. Let's see who among these Cy Young Award winners was eventually elected to Baseball's Hall of Fame. That's this column here, HOF, and we click the drop down and we're going to deselect everything first and then we're going to choose Y, which in this case means yes, they were elected to the Hall. Click OK and we see just the Hall of Fame pictures. So let's go a little bit deeper now and uh, wait, let me tell you before we do that, you'll notice that next to Hall of Fame here, there is this filter icon. So that's an easy way of looking here at a glance and seeing that this table is filtered by this column. So now let's go deeper and order these Hall of Famers by number of strikeouts. And we'll do this by customizing the filter. Just uh, click the drop down menu next to strikeouts and we are going to choose largest to smallest. So now we're in order by strikeouts. Whoever had the most is at the top. Now we're gonna do one more filter adjustment. We're going to see how many of these Hall of Famers won their Cy Young Award with fewer than 20 wins. Next to wins, again, click the drop down menu and under filter, or in this case, number filters, we're gonna choose less than and then we'll punch in two zero for 20. Click OK. And these are the pitchers who won fewer than 20 games and won the Cy Young Award. And uh, you can see in some cases it's a relief pitcher. The last thing we're going to talk about in this topic area is how to sum up the total. So let's say we wanted to see how many of uh, what the total number of strikeouts that these uh, half dozen or so pitchers had over the course of time. It's as simple as clicking the bottom and then clicking auto sum and hitting enter. Now one thing that's nice about this, if you are to take off the filter, you can see that it automatically updates the subtotals. So you could take off all the filters return the list to its uh, pretty close to its original form and uh, from 1967 to 2017 this is the number of strikeouts from these pitchers. That is our overview of managing lists. Now on to our next topic, working with dates. Dates and times are two of the most common data types people work with in Excel but they can be frustrating to work with because Excel uses a serial number to represent a date instead of the typical month, day, and year, and hours, minutes, and seconds that we're used to in our day-to-day -day lives. It's further complicated by the fact that dates are also days of the week, like a Monday or a Friday. Even though Excel doesn't specifically store Mondays and Fridays and other days in the cells. For example, we see March 27th, 2018 and 2.17 p.m. in Excel sees 4281 and 0.0951, etc. Obviously, serial numbers are not intuitive to use. But fortunately, Excel has a set of functions to make it easier to find and use dates and times. You'll find the date functions on the formula part of the ribbon under date and time. Quite a few to choose from. For our purposes today, we're going to focus on today and now. So uh, looking first off, the today function is useful when you need to see the current date displayed in your worksheet. And it will give you your current date regardless of when you open the workbook. It's going to always update it to today's date. The today function is also useful for calculating intervals. So here's a quick example. Uh, you might use this formula to calculate someone's age. 
So we put in equal the year function and then here's today and today always has this open and close parentheses with no information in it. So that's just going to calculate whatever today is on your computer and it's going to then subtract the years. Okay, so that formula for someone born in 1965 as of this date uh, or at some point this year they'll turn 53. Okay. Now, the now function takes the today function a step farther by including the time. Uh, it, can be, it can calculate a value based on the current date and time and have the value updated each time you open the worksheet, just like with today. So that's two basic formulas. We're not going to go into any more depth with them uh, since their use can be so wide and varied. But what I do want to do now is show you formats of dates. If you go back to the home ribbon, you'll find your formattings here. Let's go down and we have a short date and a long date, as well as more number formats here. And under date, you can see many ways of displaying your information. So if you remember from a few moments ago, I talked about the serial numbers. So you can have Excel calculate using its own system and then you can have your information, your dates and times displayed in any manner you would like. Now on to a demo of using dates and formulas. Let's check back in with Sally and the sales team. Let's say that we'd like to see the actual date here instead of the day of the week. So first we'll change Monday to, let's start with next week, 4-2-18. And then we just for Tuesday, we will make a little formula here B2, oops, sorry, B1 plus 1. So we'll take Monday's date and add a day to it. And then let's just copy and paste the rest of the week. And then we can copy the entire set of labels, go to week 2, copy paste and we're going to do 4 9 18 and that'll do the rest so really easy to go and populate your worksheet with the date of each day rather than the day of the week now let's do something a little more complex using a date function and we're going to figure out how many days are left in the month all right, and the way we do that is we start our function with an equal sign and then date. And we're going to put in the end of the month. So that's 2018 for the year, 4 for the month, 30 for the day. And then we're going to subtract today's date. Today, open paren, close paren. That's all you ever need for that. And as you can see, it says 42. But once we hit April 1st, it will uh, be 30 and count down from there. So that's a look at working with dates and date and time functions. Our next topic is formatting and conditional formatting. We've already seen how to format numbers. Now we're going to see how we can use formatting to highlight cell values and formula results, making for quicker analysis and drawing of conclusions. So let's revisit our list of Cy Young Award winners and let's have ERA, uh, any ERA lower than two show up highlighted in red. So you want to select the entire data range first. Uh, and you're easy to just click the top of the column and highlight everything. Now let's click on conditional formatting. You can see there's a lot of choices here. Different sets, different data bars, creating rules. Uh, for our purposes, we are going to highlight cell rules. And we're going to choose less than. And we want less than 2.00. And that will be filled with light red with dark red text. So you can see here, we have anything lower than 2 is in red. And obviously it's all red down here because I selected the entire column. So perhaps I should have just grabbed the uh, cells with data. Now here's another 
example, let's revisit the sales team and create an at-a-glance way of seeing who's on target. Uh, we'll select all the data cells, like so. And then again, we'll click conditional formatting. And what we're going to do this time is create a new rule. And we are just going to format all the cells based on their values. And the style, we want it to be the uh, traffic light style. So here it is. And what we'll do is anybody that's 300 and over is in the clear. They're green. So one thing that's a little weird here is you have to click the type uh, before you enter the value. It's a little weird to do it that way, but now you know and uh, you won't get confused when you do something like this. If I hit 200 here and hit the tab key, oh, didn't quite get, uh, yeah, I click on number and it goes back to zero. So 200 and OK, and voila, we can see at a glance who's at or above goal. They are in green. Those who are in between 200 and 300 are yellow, and those below 200 are in red. Pretty cool, right? Now let's use a formula to set the conditional formatting. Let's highlight the entire range once again and conditional formatting. We're going to again choose a new rule and this time we're going to use a formula to determine which cells to format. Okay, So the formula that we want to use is equal b to less than 200 because we want to see at a glance who among all of our sales reps is under $200 at this time or for this week. So then we click Format and Fill, and we're going to just do it in yellow. And OK twice, and there you see all the reps who have yet to hit $200 for the week. So there are just two more topics to cover in this particular area, and these are practical tips. Okay, I want to show you if you weren't the person who created a particular spreadsheet and you opened it for the first time and you wanted to see if it had any conditional formatting, uh, how would you do it? How would you find those cells that have conditional formatting without clicking on each cell? Well, here's how. All you need to do is here on the home menu, choose find and select and we're going to look for conditional formatting. And you can see here that this entire block was had conditional formatting assigned to it. So that's a really easy way to find conditional formatting. Now the other thing I wanted to show you is what if you wanted to apply this conditional formatting to other sheets in this workbook. That is really easy but not that intuitive. What have we done? We've done conditional formatting. So what does that mean? We can use the Format Painter. Click it once if we're going to format just one block, but we'll do a couple. So click Format Painter twice, and then we're going to go back to this worksheet, paint over it, uh, you know what I did? I deselected the Format Painter by mistake. So, two clicks. See the paintbrush icon? Now we go to week three, paint it. Week two, paint it. And week one, paint it. Very easy. Okay? Now let's look at another set of logic-based functions and formulas, the IF function. Here's where we start to rely on Excel to help us analyze and surface important data and the relationships between the data. In the same way that conditional formatting helps us see when certain conditions are true, the IF functions and related formulas reveal when certain criteria are met 
when certain things are in fact true. We can also stack multiple criterios or scenarios into one formula, bringing a lot of power to the if function. Anyway, let's pause for a second and look at how Excel explains the if function. Because the language of this function can take a little while to fully understand. So the if function defined. The if function checks whether a condition is met. And it returns one value if that condition is true and another value if it's false. So looking at the syntax here, the logical test is any value or expression. So does cell B2 equal 200? If the value is true, then perhaps we show display the word yes in a cell to the right of B2. And if it is false, then we say no to the right of B2. So let's build a formula looking at each part of this as we go. Back again with our sales team. It's nearing the end of the month and we've introduced a couple of sales bonus opportunities. The first is a sales goal of $800 for each rep. In our spreadsheet, we want a simple yes or no to appear in this column here, okay? So here's the formula. The logical test value is going to use the amount in the difference column, right? Column I because any difference greater than zero means the rep has exceeded the goal of 800. So let's start with that. Equal if I2 is greater than zero, comma, uh, what we want it to do if the value is true is answer the question yes, and then if it's false, no. Whoops, we need the parentheses. Uh, the quote marks I mean and hit enter and so you can see that is the case here this rep has exceeded it so it's yes and we can just uh, copy these all the way down like so and you can see the test is instantly run and we have the answers now let's turn our attention to this top sales column and imagine that not only can our reps earn a bonus for sales of 800 or higher but that whoever sells the most wins a prize so we need a formula with a function that compares each rep to the other four reps and returns only one winner and that function is called and a n d it's probably self-evident, but the AND requires the formula to find more than one truth to return a logical test of true. In other words, considering our team here to have gotten to the value of true, Chester's difference would need to be greater than Sally's and Joe's and Maria's and Abdul's, right? So this is how that formula is written. We already know that Chester's our winner, so as not to make things anticlimactic, we'll go ahead and build our first formula around him. So bear with me, because we gotta type a little bit. So the formula is and, uh, is if and, and then we're going to say, again, we're using the difference column, I5 for Chester is greater than Sally's, I2 is greater than Joe's, I3 is greater than Maria's I4, uh, sorry, I5 is greater than I4, and I5 is greater than I6. We close it, comma, and we're gonna just have it say winner, and then nothing if that's not the case, and then close it, hit return, and we can see that Chester is our winner. Now I've uh, pre-filled this with another column of the same uh, formulas. Let's unhide that. So here's top sales, and you can see that it's the winner, but as you can see, while I can copy and paste this first formula uh, to each of these, we then need to go in and hand edit each one. So all of these will start with I2 and have all the rest of four, uh, three, four, five, and six. 
this will be I3 and have I2 and I4, 5, and 6, etc. down the row. So that is how we do function within an if base formula. Now there is one more common function that is also a companion function to the if function and that is the OR function. So let's imagine that there is a third and admittedly dire circumstance that could occur to one or more of our sales reps. Whoever does not make the sales goal or does not sell at least three premium upgrades is going to get fired. We'll call this the Glen Gary, Glen Ross situation for those who have uh, seen the movie. In other words, even if a rep misses the sales goal of $800, they can still be safe if they sell at least three upgrades, okay? three premium upgrades. So here is how that formula is written. Just like we saw with the AND function, we will nest the OR right after our IF function. So let's start up here in M2. We'll hit equal IF and then OR. Oops, I'm sorry. IF OR. Let's move my mouse a little bit so you can see better. And we're going to say if I2, again using the difference column, I2 is greater than, and let's do equal to zero because technically zero means they at the goal equal to zero and then comma or L2 is greater than two. Close that and comma. We're going to do safe if our expression is true and we're going to do fired if it is false. Paren, but Excel took care of that for us automatically and then we'll just copy this down and see what the results are. No need to change or edit the formula. Okay, so let's check it here. Maria, she came up short by $100 on the sales goal and she only sold one premium. So unfortunately, Maria is not gonna be continuing with us because she didn't make the incentives. So believe it or not, that brings us to the end of part two of Excel Like a Pro. Our intermediate class is now complete. We will have a third part three coming up in April. The date is to be announced and that will be our advanced Excel Like a Pro class. Thanks so much for joining me and take care.